telling you about is not comfortable to tell you about. I don't really want to be in front of people I know and people who are in my community bringing what I consider to be quite shocking news. We are in times of unprecedented awfulness but at a time when people are extraordinarily starting to engage with something that we have been talking about so thank you very much for coming tonight this means you have already started to engage nobody here has got all the answers it's about us being brave enough to ask each other the right question one is we have known about this for a really 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 long time um, we know without going into any great detail that the fossil fuel companies were talking about this in the 1950s and 60s and some climate scientists were then. Last time I looked we're now at 2019 and we've just started to wake up to it collectively so it's taken us a while. In some ways we've sort of known about it and decided not to talk about it. We are currently at 1.1 degrees higher globally than we were in pre-industrial levels and our threshold as delivered by the IPCC is 1.5 degrees is the one we're going to try and stay underneath. Now the global average is important because it means in some places it's going to be much 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 hotter than 1 degrees or 1.5 degrees. In some places it's 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 degrees and we've seen some really dramatic things happening at the poles. You've seen what happened last year in terms of our weather globally and internationally um, and is happening now. And if you sort of look at that little diagram, you can see pre-industrial nothing, we are here just over one, and then it gives an example of it just gets bad, very bad, and very, very bad. So it's really, really important that we all do everything we possibly can to not get any worse. If you look at an, an image of how much carbon that means, um, the first one up here, the current trend, where we're on now, what our trajectory is, so we've got a massive change massive change. I'll just say massive again, just in case it didn't get through. We're talking about unprecedented levels of change. The evidence is there, the damage is being done. What do we, the international community, do about it? It's no good squabbling over who's responsible or who should pay. We have to look forward, not backward, and we shall only succeed in dealing with the problems through a vast international cooperative effort. The need for more research should not be an excuse for delaying much needed action now. There is already a clear case for precautionary action at any international level. Anybody, any idea who might have said that? Donald Trump. <laughs> That's on the other planet that we all inhabit, is it? Yeah, she did. She was for turning because she changed her mind on this. She said this in... 1989 um, and she said something similar the following year and then what happened so we were talking about it but do you remember that do you associate this woman with an understanding of climate change exactly we've sort of somehow designed it out or erased it or whitewashed it it's like it never actually happened right this one superficially apart from a few obvious signs of pollution and deterioration things do not look that serious and the planet could continue as it is for some time such evasiveness serves as a license, that's a problem, to carrying on with our present lifestyles and models of production and consumption. This is the way human beings contrive to feed their self-destructive vices, trying not to see them, trying not to acknowledge them, delaying the important decisions and pretending that nothing will happen. This is where we're at. It's no longer enough then simply to state that we should be concerned for future generations. We need to see that what is at stake is our own dignity leaving an inhabitable planet, I'm too short for this really, to future generations is first and foremost up to us. Thank you. Anybody any idea? Mm. Right. So this guy's on it as well. So we've got a Tory Prime Minister and a very religious dude and they're both saying it. Okay. <laughs> the third one, right now, we're facing a man-made disaster of global scale, our greatest threat in thousands of years, climate change. If we don't take action, the collapse of our civilizations, that's us, and the extinction of much of the natural world, also us, is on the horizon. The world's people have spoken, their message is clear, time is running out, they want you, the decision makers, to act now. Any idea? Exactly. So this is where we are now. To me, there's a clear thread running through all of those. 
We ignored it twice or we let it be designed out. We cannot do that now. Does everybody know the story of the Emperor's New Clothes? Mm. Who was it that called out the bare-bottomness, can I say that in a church, <laughs> of the Emperor? Yeah, a, a child, exactly. And I want to introduce you to our modern-day child calling out the bare-assness of our current economic, social, and environmental models. When I was about eight years old, I first heard about something called climate change or global warming. Apparently that was something humans had created by our way of living. I was told to turn off the lights to save energy and to recycle paper to save resources. I remember thinking that it was very strange that humans, who are an animal species among others, could be capable of changing the Earth's climate. Because if we were, and if it was really happening, we wouldn't be talking about anything else. As soon as you turn on the TV, everything would be about that. Headlines, radio, newspapers. You would never read or hear about anything else. As if there was a world war going on. But no one ever talked about it. If burning fossil fuels was so bad that it threatened our very existence, how could we just continue like before? Why were there no restrictions? Why wasn't it made illegal? To me, that did not add up. It was too unreal. So when I was 11, I became ill. I fell into depression. I stopped talking and I stopped eating. In two months, I lost about 10 kilos of weight. Later on, I was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, OCD, and selective mutism. That basically means I only speak when I think it's necessary. Now is one of those moments. <laughs> For those of us who are on the spectrum, almost everything is black or white. We aren't very good at lying, and we usually don't enjoy participating in the social game that the rest of you seem so fond of. <laughs> I think in many ways that we autistic are the normal ones, and the rest of the people are pretty strange. <laughs> Especially when it comes to the sustainability crisis, where everyone keeps saying that climate change is an existential threat, and the most important issue of all. And yet, they just carry on like before. I don't understand that, because if the emissions have to stop, then we must stop the emissions. To me, that is black or white. There are no gray areas when it comes to survival. Either we go on as a civilization or we don't. We have to change. Rich countries like Sweden need to start reducing emissions by at least 15% every year. And that is so that we can stay below a two-degree warming target. Yet, as the IPCC have recently demonstrated, aiming instead for 1.5 degrees Celsius would significantly reduce the climate impacts. But we can only imagine what that means for reducing emissions. You would think the media and every one of our leaders would be talking about nothing else, but they never even mention it. Nor does anyone ever mention the greenhouse gases already locked in the system, nor that air pollution is hiding a warming, so that when we stop burning fossil fuels, we already have an extra level of warming, perhaps as high as 0.5 to 1.1 degrees Celsius. Furthermore, does hardly anyone speak about the fact that we are in the midst of the sixth mass extinction, with up to 200 species going extinct every single day. That the extinction rate is today between 1,000 and 10,000 times higher than what is seen as normal. Nor does hardly anyone ever speak about the aspect of equity or climate justice, 
clearly stated everywhere in the Paris Agreement, which is absolutely necessary to make it work on a global scale. That means that rich countries need to get down to zero emissions within six to 12 years with today's emission speed. And that is so that people in poorer countries can have a chance to heighten their standard of living by building some of the infrastructure that we have already built, such as roads, schools, hospitals, clean drinking water, electricity, and so on. Because how can we expect countries like India or Nigeria to care about the climate crisis if we, who already have everything, don't care even a second about it or our actual commitments to the Paris Agreement? So, why are we not reducing our emissions? Why are they, in fact, still increasing? Are we knowingly causing a mass extinction? Are we evil? No, of course not. People keep doing what they do because the vast majority doesn't have a clue about the actual consequences of our everyday life. And they don't know the rapid changes required. We all think we know, and we all think everybody knows, but we don't. Because how could we? If there really was a crisis, and if this crisis was caused by our emissions, you would at least see some signs. Not just flooded cities, tens of thousands of dead people, and whole nations leveled to piles of torn down buildings. You would see some restrictions, but no. And no one talks about it. There are no emergency meetings, no headlines, no breaking news. No one is acting as if we were in a crisis. Even most climate scientists or green politicians keep on flying around the world, eating meat and dairy. If I live to be 100, I will be alive in the year 2103. When you think about the future today, you don't think beyond the year 2050. By then, I will, in the best case, not even have lived half of my life. What happens next? The year 2078, I will celebrate my 75th birthday. If I have children or grandchildren, maybe they will spend that day with me. Maybe they will ask me about you, the people who were around back, back in 2018. Maybe they will ask why you didn't do anything, while there still was time to act. What we do or don't do right now will affect my entire life and the lives of my children and grandchildren. What we do or don't do right now, me and my generation can't undo in the future. So when school started in August this year, I decided that this was enough. I sat myself down on the ground outside the Swedish parliament. I school striked for the climate. Some people say that I should be in school instead. Some people say that I should study to become a climate scientist so that I can solve the climate crisis. But the climate crisis has already been solved. We already have all the facts and solutions. All we have to do is to wake up and change. And why should I be studying for a future that soon will be no more, when no one is doing anything whatsoever to save that future? And what is the point of learning facts within the school system, when the most important facts given by the finest science of that same school system clearly means nothing to our politicians and our society. Some people say that Sweden is just a small country and that it doesn't matter what we do. But I think that if a few children can get headlines all over the world just by not going to school for a few weeks, imagine what we could all do together if we wanted to. Now we're almost at the end of my talk. 
and this is where people usually people usually start talking about hope solar panels wind power circular economy and so on but i'm not going to do that we've had 30 years of pep talking and selling positive ideas and i'm sorry but it doesn't work because if it would have the emissions would have gone down by now they haven't and yes we do need hope of course we do but the one thing we need more than hope is action once we start to act hope is everywhere so instead of looking for hope look for action then and only then hope will come today we use 100 million barrels of oil every single day there are no politics to change that there are no rules to keep that oil in the ground so we can't save the world by playing by the rules because the rules have to be changed everything needs to change and it has to start today So it falls on me to explain something about the science and that isn't because I'm a scientist it's because I understand enough to be able to explain what I'm going to go through will demonstrate how we have collectively around the world ignored a precautionary principle this is the IPCC the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change they're employed by the UN it is a UN body. There are 2,000 plus of them from um, every nation on the planet, pretty much. They are climate scientists. They're experts in their field. They know what they're doing. They write reports. Those reports get published by politicians who filter it, by diplomats who filter it. And if you imagine that you've got diplomats from every country in the world trying to get this report and the summary of it that's going out to the world's press so that it doesn't make their country look bad. But this is a diplomat speaking. This is the head of the UN speaking about their latest report. We are in deep trouble with climate change. This is a diplomat. He's speaking to every head of every nation on the planet. It is hard to overstate the urgency of the situation. That's diplomatic language for panic. So why does he say things like that? What you can see here is the square kilometers of sea ice in the Arctic and the green line, the little wiggly green line, is the most optimistic of the IPCC's predictions as to what could happen. The red line is their least optimistic prediction of what can happen and there with that one you can see that by 2085 90 I'm not sure what that is there won't be any sea ice the black line is the real data you can see it's fallen off a cliff this report is from 2014 working off data from 2010 we're always playing on old information and this the situation is changing incredibly rapidly. We also need to know there is a locked-in cooling effect by the emissions that have gone out already. What you can see coming out of these cars is particulate matter. The particulate matter is white. It's reflective of light. So if that is in the atmosphere, which it is, it reflects light coming in and has a net cooling effect because it stops some of the sunlight coming into the earth. It's estimated that that net cooling effect is anywhere between a quarter of a degree C and, as Greta just said, 1.1 degrees C. So if we were to stop burning fossil fuels today, we didn't burn any today, those particles would start coming out of the atmosphere and that net cooling effect would disappear and the temperature would jump by whatever the reality is somewhere between a quarter of a degree 
and 1.1 degrees C. We're already at 1.1 degrees C. This is not good news, but it is a reality. And it's not something that's in the IPCC report. What do we have on the planet that reflects sunlight? Anyone? Ice. And what happens if you heat up ice? It melts. And what if that ice is sat on a dark surface and it melts and what is exposed is dark? What's going to happen to that dark surface? It's going to heat up. And guess what? That's going to melt the ice, which is going to expose more, which is going to heat up. And there is a loop, a feedback loop. It's not rocket science. There's a feedback loop. This is not built into the IPCC predictions. Trees do this thing, plants do this thing, where they take sunlight, they use that to act like a pump, which pumps water out of the soil, up through the plant, and out through their leaves. If you take a forest, that's where we get a massive part of our rain cycle from. This is a picture of the Amazon. What happens if you deforest? the Amazon. You're going to have less rain. If you've got less rain, what's that going to do to trees and plants? It's going to mean we've got less growth. If you've got less growth, what does that mean? We have a longer dry season. And what does that mean? That is another loop. The danger is we don't know when these feedback loops kick in, the tipping point for the feedback loop. We don't want to go there. We really do not want to go there. So if you look, the things in yellow, that's, those are the feedback loops that might kick in at one degree C, which then might kick the next one in. And then if that kicks that one in, that might then raise the temperature to three degrees C. And suddenly we've got a whole load of another feedback loops that kick in. And we've got what's called a cascade. And we end up in what's, what's been um, known in some papers as hothouse earth. The analogy is, it looks a little bit like this. That there's this ball on a slope that's getting ever steeper. And we don't want it to get to the point where it's so steep we can't stop it. That's basically the point. But it's not just climate change. It's also... We are in the midst of a mass extinction. And the reason for that has a lot to do with us humans. When I was born, I was born in 1963. And at that time, humans used about three quarters of what the planet produced. By 1974, by the time I was 11, humans were using everything that the planet produced in the course of a year. Today, we would need 1.7 planets to satisfy all of our demands. Clearly, we haven't got 1.7 planets, so where's that coming from? And where it's coming from is the future. We are stripping every last nutrient out of the soil to provide for today, and next year's crop won't be so rich and won't be so rich and won't be so rich. This is our ecological footprint. This is what we are, the demands we're making on the planet. Basically, you know that experience where you have too much month at the end of the money? You know, you get to, oh, I've run out of money and there's still three days until payday. Well, it's like that, except that um, 1987, there were 11 more days till payday. And uh, in 2000, there were two months until payday. And in 2010, there was whatever that is. We ran out of the money by the end of August. And I think now we're somewhere around about May. Is that right? Uh, 8th of May for the UK. So for the UK, we run out of our budget by the 8th of May. People in Africa, on average, are still using three quarters of a planet. If we all lived the way they do in Africa, if we were really able to do that, we would only need three quarters of a planet to provide for our resources. If we all lived the way the average person does in North America, we'd need five planets. And this slide is out of date. In the UK, 
that would be about four planets. I find that sobering. So what are the consequences? This is in Lancashire, and this just shows the way in which we have gone, oh, we need more farmland, we need more farmland, we'll have more farmland, we need more farmland, oh, we better have a little town over there. Oh, there's a flood. The consequence of this ecological overshoot, whilst we're making yet more demands, we are also removing the planetary systems that mitigate the, the extreme weather and the, and, and the consequences of climate change. So we're not only making it worse, we're making it worse by taking away the things that are going to help. Bonkers. I think it's a much better word than unsustainable. It's just bonkers. <laughs> There's a bit more good news in this story, I'm afraid. The world population is expected to grow. And the consequences of that, basically the consequences of that are famine. We have lived such a sheltered life in this country for so long, we have no concept of what that is. But if civilization started in the Middle East and started somewhere around Syria, in 2006 they began the worst drought that they have had, and this is a consequence of climate change that they have had since the beginnings of civilization. That drought lasted five years. Two to three million people have fell into abject poverty. The political tensions were exacerbated and we've had a civil war there. And if anyone has spoken to anybody who's had anything to do with the refugees coming out of there, it, it's heartbreaking. I was speaking to someone who described how this woman she'd been working with was walking down the road to escape from Syria, just walking down the road, and these lines of refugees, and a car ran over a child, and she had to keep walking. Couldn't even stop. We cannot imagine it. We need to be really clear what we are doing. I just mentioned Syria just now. The annual rainfall in East Anglia, which is a large American term, crop production area, which is a large area for growing crops. The annual rainfall is about the same as it used to be in Syria. We're not as protected from this as we think we might be. And I'm afraid there's a little bit more. Since the Earth began, there have been a number of mass extinctions, and there's different ways you can measure this, but most people agree there's been five mass extinctions in the past five mass extinction events, they call it. And four of those have been as a consequence of increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We know, well, we're actually in the beginnings of a mass extinction event. That's 100% of the animals that were around in 1970. 60% of them have gone. World Wildlife Fund for Nature, from October last year. We currently live in a world where if you were to weigh all the mammals on the planet, 96% of the body weight of those mammals would be human or livestock. We are currently losing 200 species a day. Not just wildlife, but of all species on the planet and there have been further studies. A study published last year attempting to quantify what it would mean for humans if climate policies fail to achieve any changes. These studies reach the conclusion that business as usual runs a risk, a 5% risk, so 1 in 20 risk, of global warming of five degrees or more. At four degrees of global warming, 74% of the world's population, as they are spread at the moment, would live in areas that would be deadly. The question is, 
How did we get ourselves to a place where something that is catastrophic, the term that's used by the IPCC is an existential crisis? Existential means it, it pertains to our existence as a species. It's not a bit of an inconvenience, it's not quite difficult, it means that our species, the ability of our species to live on the planet is now threatened. So this is about as serious as it gets. Um, in terms of sound monitoring from 1 to 10, it's definitely at 11. And you think, how did we do this? How did we get here without taking notice, <coughs> without realising, without thinking about it? And the answer, of course, is complicated. Quite a lot of magical thinking. Quite a lot of assuming that s somebody else was doing it or, or that it wasn't happening. There are still people in our councils who don't think it's happening. So not thinking it's happening, think that it might be happening, but it's probably uh, nothing to do with us. Um, or it is happening, but somebody else is taking charge of it. Or actually, it's just too complicated and difficult, and I need to think about something else like have I paid my water bill or my car needs taking in for a service or whatever it might be, all of those things that occupy the space in our minds and our hearts. And we've managed to get ourselves collectively into this mess. And quite a lot of being economical with the truth. This guy is um, a guy called Kevin Anderson. Um, he's a fantastic guy from Manchester, just putting that out there. Um, and he's the Deputy Director of the Tyndall Centre for Climate Research. Really amazing guy and he absolutely says it as it is and has been saying it as it is for quite a long time. You can find him online. He does really brilliant talks where he takes all the science, just like we've heard about this evening, and he sketches out, this is what we're looking at, guys, and it's not great. And he says, this is this socially constructed silence thing that we've been talking about. Um, if you drink half a litre of beer with a politician or a scientist, they will tell you how bad it is. But if you put a microphone there, they will tell you some optimistic nonsense about climate change. And you think, well, that's not OK, actually. Why aren't you telling us what's really happening? Because you're the scientist geezers. You know, we're sort of relying on you to tell us this stuff. And of course, that brings up a couple of obvious questions. Government's sorting it all out, isn't it? Must know, must be on it, must have got some solutions. And that's the sort of space that we're in, unfortunately, at the moment that people do think it's somebody else's problem and they haven't quite clocked. We are all in this collective space ourselves. Um, this is Lancashire, where I'm from, just in case I haven't mentioned that. Um, Sadiq Javid has overturned, this is in 2016, has overturned Lancashire Council's rejection of a fracking site, paving the way for Shell Company Quadrilla to drill in the county next year and provoking outrage from local groups environmentalists, that term always really annoys me. Like it's like you're an environmentalist or not an environmentalist. How can you not be an environmentalist? It's what we live in. But anyway, environmentalists and politicians. <coughs> so our central government overturned a local decision not to allow fracking. <coughs> Heathrow. It's claimed that current plans for Heathrow breach legal obligations. These are our laws. They breach our own laws in the Planning Act to alleviate the impact of climate change, and that controversy continues right now. Climate Change Secretary, when she was, Amber Rudd, announced a 65% cut to renewable energy subsidies. This was in 2015, yet the UK is the only G7 nation increasing fossil fuel subsidies. You sort of understand why Greta Thunberg, as a 16-year-old schoolgirl, is really, really, really cross. And she's not taking any prisoners when she stands up. She's also done the same to Davos. She said to Davos, the collective group at Davos, you are not mature enough to tell us how it is and you're leaving that to us children as well. We should hang our heads in collective shame. And then of course there's the BBC. Uh, the BBC in, uh, well last year you probably heard it, they start, there was a little bit of a controversy of whether or not the BBC was actually covering climate change or not and decided who they should and shouldn't have on programmes to talk about climate change. Climate change, they said, has been a difficult subject for the BBC and we get coverage it wrong too often, you think. Um, the document obtained by Carbon Brief said, which is one of the ones that did um, some research into it. To achieve, and this finally, finally, um, they said, to achieve impartiality, BBC's buzz buzzword, you do not need to include outright deniers of climate change in BBC coverage in the same way you would not have someone denying that Manchester United won 2-0 last Saturday. 
the referee has spoken. We know where we are now. It's a bit like getting a flat earther into a geography session, just to make sure you've covered all the bases. We know it's the case. And just to, to uh, reiterate the point that um, David made, we are seeing um, a really quite hideous uh, combination of massive climate impacts locally, as has happened across the Middle East and as happening in um, Sub-Saharan Africa. And I'm not even going to go what's happening in Northern Africa with Spanish enclaves and Sub-Saharan Africans trying to get into Europe because that's the only way they might have a future. Utterly, utterly gut-wrenching to see what's happening. Um, this is some of the caravan of Latin Americans trying to move into the States. There's two really difficult things here. One is Trump is making this into a very, very bad thing that he's effectively mobilising. They're weaponising border control and making it into a political issue. At the same time, as not understanding that this is going to happen more and more and more and more across the globe. And there are all sorts of figures that are suggesting by the middle of the century we're looking at 250 million people. There are even some figures that say one in nine people are going to be on the move. As, of course, I would be. I would be on the move with my children if I couldn't actually feed them where I was. Of course they will be. And our response at the moment, EU border police has seen their budget increase by 6,000%. This is our response to this. And then, of course, this is happening right now. This happened over a weekend, one weekend in Australia, last November. 23,000 spectacle fox bats died. They literally fell out of the trees. That's a third of the species over a weekend died because it was too hot. And yet this time now, this is just a matter of months on, you're looking at 500,000 livestock dead in freezing cold floods. Same continent. And the impact is devastating across economic, social, environmental spheres. So this is what we're seeing now. So it's not about some, some time over there with those people then. It's here, now, and us. This socially constructed silence that I talked about is really, really, really important. And this is, has to be our first role is to decide to talk about this. Because until we do, it's never going to be engaged with. This is a quotation from RTE, which is the Irish broadcaster. And this came out January this year because they were challenged on how much they were covering climate change in their... This is a, a public broadcasting corporation. And, and the um, director general said, as a broader point, if there is little by way of action on climate change in terms of legislative change, policy initiatives, parliamentary debate and business innovation, regrettably, my underlining, there is less for the media as a whole to report on. That's not my understanding of what the media is for. That's what the government and business are doing. That's one part, one part of what they should be reporting on. And if they're not doing anything, and it's happening, aren't they two reasons the media should be reporting it? And of course the problem is, if the government isn't doing anything, and the media therefore, as a result, doesn't report on it, then it's not happening. Then in actual fact people aren't engaged, they can't put pressure on their government, and you have a beautifully complete loop of silence. Nobody's talking about it, so nobody's talking about it. But we can change that. And the obvious question... Two is, doesn't the law help? Yeah, well, you know, we haven't done so well on that either. And if you think about any change that we have wanted or created or engaged with over the last 200, 300, 500 years, generally it's involved having to demand it and probably going up against um, our legal structures. This woman, an extraordinary woman called Polly Higgins, is currently creating an ecocide law where she's trying to make environmental damage illegal to... to um, respond to exactly that point that Greta said, that there are, we have no laws that make us keep this stuff in the ground. We have no laws that make it a crime to do the sorts of damage we're doing at the moment across our ecosystems that are the things that keep us alive. This is not about tree hugging because it's a nice thing to do. From a perspective of enlightened self-interest and survival, we need those systems. We are part of those systems. This is about survival of everything. And it's not about saving the planet either. The planet's a rock. The planet will be fine. It's everything that's trying to live on it that has got a really significant problem, and that includes us. And of course, this means possibly getting arrested, which is one of the things that Extinction Rebellion people have said. In order to be visible, in order to get rid of that socially constructed silence, in order to make it a priority and to see it as an emergency, this is one way of getting the intention of the people who are 
allegedly making the decisions to support us. So it's, maybe it's not such a bad thing to be arrested. If Caroline Lucas is willing to do that, then that's a politician I can put my faith in and I can follow. So when it comes to some of the action that Extinction Rebellion wants to look at, this is about collective action and we do promote the notion of getting arrested as a movement, as a horizontal movement, but it doesn't mean that everybody has to get arrested. It's one of the things that we're doing. It's about understanding there's a long range of things we can do. We start by talking about it, and then there's lots and lots of other things you can do, and if you want to get into the space of getting arrested in order to make a point, then you can. It's non-violent. It's utterly, profoundly, completely, uncompromisingly non-violent as a movement. And the reason for that is that what works. This was in 1963, two years before I was born, the year that you were born. This is in Jackson, Mississippi. This is the Woolworth store. Those kids practiced that. They practiced that before they went into the diner in order to have the right to sit at the diner, to eat at the diner as black kids with their white friends because they knew that would happen. And they got the friends to pour mustard and salt and pepper and sugar over their heads to find a way of making themselves resilient to the experience they knew they would get. So they did it, they planned it, they broke those social laws, and legal laws actually, and they sat at the diner. And that was one of the crucial moments in the civil rights movement. They had to break the rules, just like Greta says. The rules are no longer fit for purpose, maybe we need to change them. But they did it in a completely non-violent way. And that allows other people to engage with the issue. And in actual fact, it affects us all. This is a woman who works in the health industry and she also got hauled away from one of the Extinction Rebellion demonstrations. She's, I cannot see what possible harm that woman is doing by saying climate change is a health risk. Really? You think, do we think she's a threat? And this guy, he's a professor of psychology at Bristol University and I went to, I spoke to him last week and he got himself arrested just before Christmas as a professor of psychology in a university, a very high profile university, because he said I'd rather get arrested than keep quiet about climate breakdown any longer. So when you start having those conversations, in actual fact, you might find yourself having a conversation with somebody who was really, 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 really wanted to have this conversation, but didn't know how to start, didn't know how to broach it, didn't know how you felt, didn't even know how to talk about it, felt confused about some of the stats. There's loads of us that want to talk. And this is my mate Sandra, who I met in front of the Broadcasting House and BBC at a demonstration just before Christmas. And she said, we demand, this is again, this notion of a silence that we've constructed. We demand that the BBC cover climate change properly and tell us their truth. Tell us the truth. It's their duty to inform and educate as well as to entertain. And on, she's got a blindfold on and her sign says, see no climate chaos. And her two mates have, hear no climate signs <laughs> and speak no climate emergency. That's called the lock on. They've got tubes around their arms covered in cardboard and tape, so it makes it very, very difficult for them to be dismantled as a unified group. And just to be clear, Sandra is a retired librarian, her mate is a retired teacher, and the other is a working Bristol GP. So this is everybody now starting to take to the streets to say, actually, this is about my life, my future, my kids' future, my family's future, my colleagues' future. It's about now. It's not four generations hence, it's now and we need to take to the streets. They sat there all morning. And of course, young and old are out. She is out every Friday. Utterly, utterly amazing. And I don't know how okay it's to say it in, in a church, but this is in Australia. Scott Morrison, who is one of their leaders. Scott Morrison, you're so full of SH asterisk T that the toilet is jealous. <laughs> <laughs> jealous spelt J-E-L-O-U-S. Okay. And this is in Belgium. So the Belgian kids went on strike and the minister said, oh, there's a conspiracy between the secret services uh, and the children. And it's very, very bad and they're very, very scary. Uh, it took about a week for them to say, yeah, sorry, that was a bit of a fib, there was no conspiracy, and the kids are right, and they resigned. So in actual fact, people are starting to realise that we have had this ability to effect change, we've just never actually used it before. And I suppose that means that we have a choice. 
Do we understand what Greta has laid, literally laid bare for us, or do we carry on with blind force going in the same direction and saying, okay, acquiescing to the grey suits who are not able sometimes, they're not bad people, but find it very, very difficult to engage with this stuff. This is part of our new role. And it's really important to note that we are not alone. We are definitely not alone. Um, Cornwall has, yes, Cornwall declared um, a climate emergency, the first county to declare a climate emergency. And what, somebody asked me, was that just like um, they just got it or was there a lot of work behind it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. Let, let me think about that. Oh, yeah, not, not answer one. Huge amount of work behind the scenes and lots of engagement with lots and lots of parish council and town councils and credit to the councillors and the officers who are really pushing. There are lots of people who are behind us now. It's just a matter of finding finding and connecting. So lots of people across the UK and lots of people across the world. We don't quite know what that means we have to do yet collectively, but it means that we are facing in the right direction and only by facing in the right direction can we start to figure out what the first steps might be rather than the silence and the blindfolds. And XR, Extinction Rebellion, have three really clear demands. Very, very simple. The first one is the government must tell the truth quite uncontroversial of thought, must tell the truth about the ecological emergency, reverse inconsistent policies like we've just seen, and work alongside the media to communicate with citizens, all profoundly reasonable. You know, just do your job, don't fib, tell us stuff. That seems okay. Secondly, the government must enact legally binding policy measures to reduce carbon emissions to net zero by 2025 and to limit the global ecological footprint to half a planet, going back to what David said. At the moment, the Climate Change Act says we have to bring our emissions down by 80% by 2050. It's basically nowhere near enough. And thirdly and lastly, we demand a citizens' assembly to oversee the changes as part of creating a democracy fit for purpose. And a citizens' assembly is essentially people coming together to say that's complicated, as it did in Ireland, when Ireland figured out how to tackle abortion. If Ireland can figure out how to tackle abortion as a Catholic country, very, very, very difficult, very difficult, complicated, profound, deep views, then absolutely we can start looking at what model they use to start looking at other very, very difficult issues. It's through a notion called sortition, it's very, very old, and essentially you bring people together so that they can move, go through a process of understanding a complicated issue, have their voices heard, meet other, perhaps opposing views, figure out what the space is in between, and move from public opinion, which can be a bit knee-jerk, to public judgment, which strikes me, again, as a very sensible <coughs> idea. And the issue is, really, we just need to turn up. We need to turn up physically, emotionally, morally, psychologically, intellectually, be present, figure out what's going on, and start creating a space where we can engage with this, as these kids did in Truro. A week after the kids came out, 224 <coughs> academics wrote a letter to say, absolutely, we're behind them. And then a week later, the teachers joined the climate <coughs> protest to say, we need to change the curriculum. They're right, actually. Our curriculum, we can slide it in and we have a bit of a maths lesson and we can bring in a little bit of geography and we can add a few facts here, but we're not talking about this as the biggest planetary threat we have ever experienced. So now they're demanding on the back of what the kids have done, they're saying we need to do this properly, which I think is really interesting. So in terms of that turning up, this is what a first bit of 224 academics look like. That's just half of them saying the kids have got it, these are all doctors and professors. In fact, there are plenty in Cornwall who signed this letter. So everybody has got our backs now in terms of saying, yeah, maybe we need to break the rules a little bit. Maybe we need to start testing what those boundaries are because staying within them hasn't actually done what's required. <laughs>